we talked about the subject of homesteading. I had mentioned uh, one of the meetings, and I don't remember which one it is now, um, about the importance of what is needed when we talk about homesteading. There's three major areas. There's a lot of things that goes within the boundaries of those three areas. And we're just going to kind of try to cover through some of these three areas. There is no way we can completely, you know, cover it totally, but we're going to look at it. And those three areas are shelter. It's not too fun to live on a homestead without a shelter. And believe me, we have seen everything you can imagine on homesteading ideas when it comes down to shelter. And we actually watched this program. It's on computer. We don't own a TV, don't want to own a TV, but we do have a computer and there are different, you know, real interesting programs on homesteading. And that's really how we found out how things have got crazy. Um, because we've been doing this for years. I mean, literally for almost 40 years in our, our life experience. And um, we just thought it was a way of life because that's the way we chose to live because we thought things were coming and we still do. And, and all of a sudden, Chris found these programs on homesteading, so we started watching them. We'd try to watch one at least once a week um, just to see where the barometer was, what was going on out there. And uh, we were... <laughs> we were kind of quite surprised and quite shocked to tell you the truth. Um, a good friend of ours that lives in Missouri, she's a big rancher, and her whole family's been into big ranching, and um, she is highly educated in government agriculture. And um, we were visiting not long ago, and... Is an old girlfriend of my wife's from about 40 to 45, or probably about 45 years ago when they grew up together, and went to college together. And when they got back in touch with each other after all these many years, my wife and, and this lady began to start communicating and talking and visiting. And so Amy asked Chris, well, what are you and Ron doing now? And said, well, we're kind of homesteading. And she just kind of shut down. Um, and Chris couldn't figure out what in the world and why she would just kind of shut down and didn't really want to talk about that. And she, so she'd move away. Well, after a period of time of visiting with her, we began to realize why she was shutting down. Because out in Missouri, like there is in a lot of places in this country, People that have gone to the land and call themselves homesteaders <clears throat> It's a mess It's an absolute mess very few people have any conceptions about organization and order They think going to the land that they, they don't care what the land looks like what they turn it into is an absolute nightmare. And so, like last night when I asked the question about when you, when you mention homesteading, where are you at? Because it's very easy for me to offend people and I don't mean to offend anybody, but I'm not into trash. I'm not into being a dump. And even if I wasn't a believer in Christ, I believe that organization is the art to successful homesteading. It cannot be disorganized, and that's why I kind of chose to work through some of these ideas of these three major areas in homesteading. Shelter. A lot of these people, Amy knew a lot of people because she was involved with agriculture, and her husband was too, from a government level. And so they were very acquainted with these different people that were coming to the Missouri-Arkansas area. 
that were, quote, back to land or homesteaders. And they would put up a shanty that they were raising their children in, and there was filth everywhere. And so Amy automatically just shut down because she was so acquainted with homesteaders that were just horrible examples of homesteading. And when I think of homesteading, I think of the yesteryears when grandma and grandpa and great grandma and grandpa and great great grandma and grandpa were homesteaders on the land. And when you walked upon these farms, and I've looked a lot, it doesn't mean they all were that way, but the successful homesteads, the ones that were successful, were organized. Their farms were put in place. They didn't have to have super fancy places, but they needed to have a plan. And so one of the things I want to stress to all of you before you ever think about homesteading, you've got to have a plan. You've got to know what you're going after, what you're looking for, and what you're going to do. And one of the things that we have seen in our time in, in living this way is the lack of organization. <laughs> and, and as Christian believers, I believe that heaven's first order is order. Heaven is very orderly. And if you know anything about the Bible, you'll see that as you study through various different concepts. It is very orderly and, and put in an organized manner. So when we talk about shelters or, or uh, a place to live, we're going to kind of look at some of those things um, as we progress in it. But I just want to stress to this friend, Amy, of my wife's, and I met Amy many, many years ago before my wife and I were married. Um, we were, uh, I guess you'd use the word courting, but we had met one another and we only knew each other a month. And here we are 40, almost 43, 44 years later. Um because it was a match in heaven, I do believe. But anyhow, in spite of that, I met Amy. She'd come to visit Chris where we were at and where we'd met. And then we just lost contact. Well, we just, like I said, we just kind of met one another again. Chris did with Amy. Well, Amy came to visit us just about a month ago. And she didn't know what to expect because she was so turned off with homesteaders that she was afraid when she was asking Chris, what are you guys doing? I said, well, we're kind of homesteading. And boy, hey, like I said, she just shut down. Well, when she came to our place, one of the things that she said to Chris, she says, wow. So I'm impressed. And that's what you want. You want the public, you want the people to be able to see what you're doing is a testimony of positiveness. All right? It doesn't take a lot of money to do that. Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> but it takes just simple vision and organization is what it takes. What's going on? Keep it pressed. All right. I brought these pictures along because that's all I have, and I'm not trying to brag about what we've done. I'm just trying to encourage you that you don't have to have a big place, but a nice place to be a good example to the public and to the people you're working with. So shelter. Shelter is very important, and especially as we have been talking for the last few meetings on the need of a place in the country to where you're not dependent on the system. Um, I don't want to have to go back into stressing how important that is. Um, if we have been listening to things, we have somehow got to get this wrapped around our mind. The system isn't always going to be the way we've had it. 
it's going to come to a screeching halt. In our state of Kentucky, and I don't know what's going on down here, I do to some degree because I drove in here and I saw, wow, 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 the people everywhere. And what that means, like it's happening in the state of Tennessee, in the state of Kentucky, it's actually within about 10 to 15 states from the Rockies this direction, all right? In the states that we live in, and of course the southern states, even the northern states, are the oldest states within the Union, meaning that there's what? A lot of people. Is that right? Well, in yesteryear, there wasn't any such thing as electricity, and that's not too far many years ago. And a lot of people were living without electricity and without a lot of things. And one of the reasons why I'm going to be bringing these things up is to help you to realize within our states, I've been, we get a magazine that comes from the state of Kentucky. It's called Kentucky Living. I don't know if you all have one of those like that down here or not. But the CEO of the electric company of these major state co-ops of electricity power. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. There is a huge cooperative and these huge cooperatives are blended together as a union, if you please. And the CEO that is the CEO of this big cooperative write these articles in the Kentucky Living. He's put out thus far five articles. And in those articles, what he is saying, if you people don't get your act together, you're going to be without. There's federal mandates in this country right now from the federal government to shut your coal plants down, to shut your, uh, your nuclear plants down, and find alternative ways of creating power. Anyone know the name Elon Musk at all in here? Yeah. You know what he's saying? And he's the big guru of the electric car system and many other things, and he's a very scary man. What he's saying is there's no way our grid can handle this. Do you comprehend? Is it hitting home at all? Right. You're saying it can't handle the change, right? It is not in no way prepared in any way, shape, or form okay. to handle a, a, a system of electricity. <clears throat> the CEO of Kentucky, and again, like I said, I don't know what's going on down here because I don't keep up with it all. But this huge cooperative is saying we're in trouble. This is no joke, and I'm not saying this to put a paranoia on you. But you could wake up tomorrow and this is gone. They're telling us right now, as I speak today, that they're going to start creating mandatory blackouts within these states. In free America, right? Mandatory blackouts. They've given us within five years. Within five years, they want the coal plant shut down and the nuclear plant shut down. The CEO is telling us very clearly, my friends, that we cannot, we cannot produce enough power for the amount of people that is developing in this country. We are running out. So what does that mean to you? I mean, this is just one area. Another area we're gonna end up talking about is your food source. 
Do you know what's happening across the country right now just on that subject alone? It's worse than shortages. We saw in the pandemic, we saw what was happening to the stores, did you not? Just a trial young, a run. The stores were being empty. Do you know how many days you have of food supply in Walmart? You don't even have a day. That's how serious this thing is God. In this country right now, and I cannot stress it to you all enough, do not become comfortable where you're at. You just cannot. You cannot afford to do that anymore. They don't like people like myself trying to warn y'all to get up and do something. It's coming, brethren. Whether it's the end of the world or not, I don't know. But I do know we're facing a crisis in this country like we have never seen. We used to have five years, five years of food reserves in this country. You know how many we have now? We don't even have a month. The Federal Reserve's of food bank is gone. How important is it for us to understand what are we going to do? Home, shelter. As we talk about home shelter, I cannot stress it to you all enough, the importance of a proper built home. It is extremely important, and I know it's almost overwhelming at the time and hour that we're living in. What am I going to do? This thing is coming upon us, and we've almost waited too late. I don't know how much time we have, but I'm telling you, the clock is running out, folks. Shelter is going to be one of your big key pins in homesteading. Whether it lasts for years or, or months or whatever, we need to have proper homestead shelters. And when I talk about shelters, I think of what yesteryear was. I don't know if there's anyone in this room that remembers what grandma and grandpa did. Now, some of the black folks that are in here have probably got some memory of how their, their folks lived. And how grandma and grandpa live, because I've met a lot of those people. That's how I learned a lot, what I know, is they knew how to make it go. And they set up their place in such a way that when we talk about homesteading and shelter, we're not just talking about the house you're going to sleep and live in. For instance, when we talk about a shelter, that shelter has to be set up to be able to handle the winter and the summer months. Does that make any waves in your head at all? Winter and summer months, you don't have the privilege going over there and turning the heat on. You don't have the privilege of going over there and turning the air conditioner on. What are you going to do? We're so used to being able to go over there to the thermostat and turn that thing on and all of a sudden our house is chilled. You all ever think of those things? This is real. If the power system fails tomorrow, where will you be? talk about these things about shelter, did you? 
but it's very important so that when you think about a shelter, one of the things that we have to really deal with is the location of that shelter. <clears throat> the location of that shelter means everything to you. When you're homesteading, you just don't want to just build it anywhere. Or you don't want it to be just anywhere. You've got to think about what you're doing because if you've got to think as if we're talking about being off grid and you're having that independence, that shelter means everything to you because that's where you're going to be living. That's, that's your, your place of safety, if you please. When I think of the shelter, I think of two things when it comes down to homesteading. That is your primary home, and then your secondary home. And what I mean about your secondary home is where are you gonna cook your meals at? How are you gonna cook that meal when the grid system no longer exists? A wood stove. Now, let me ask you, sister, where do you want that wood stove in the middle of 100 degree weather? <laughs> you don't want it in the house because you're going to be sweating big time. You don't have air conditioning. And you don't want to heat that house any hotter than it's already going to be because of the summer heat. Is that right? You want a cookhouse. Years ago, the homestead homes had two units to it. And a lot of them had a, a breezeway between the two units. And this unit over here was the cookhouse. And it was full of windows or screening. It was used primarily during the hot season of the year. In the cold season of the year, they helped heat the house by the wood cook stove in the house. Because you've got to think outside the box. We have been so broken down and so brainwashed and taught what we live like today that we don't even know how to compute anything otherwise. You just go to the kitchen, you turn the stove on because your air conditioning's on or your central air and heat is on and everything's cool, right? Turn it off and see where you land. Turn it off and see what happens to you. You won't be able to cook a meal. You won't even be able to stay in the house because it's gonna get hot because it's not even insulated properly. Now, so when we talk about shelter, I want you to think of these things. You've got to have your, your, your home, and then you've got to have your secondary home. The secondary home is your cookhouse. Now, in that cookhouse, like I said, it's predominantly used for the hot period of the season. It's not going to be fun even at that to cook on a wood cook stove in that kind of weather. And especially if you're down here in the south. But you surely don't want that wood cook stove in your home when you're cooking a meal, whether it be breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Or supper, I should say. According to what I was saying yesterday about the dinner and supper time. <laughs> so... Think of that through. Now, this home that you see up here on the board or up on the screen, um, I've been building homes for a number of years, and I built all of our most all of our homes that we've lived in. And one of the things I want to explain to you all about a home is you've got to think outside of the box. These modern homes today are not made for homesteading. You think of your home, and you think seriously about how you're going to heat that home when it's all chopped up. It's got walls everywhere. 
And the heat can't be distributed through that house with a nickel if you're depending on a wood stove to heat your house. Yesteryear, these homes that were built in the years gone by were built efficiently enough to where the heat was centralized in that home so that it would heat the home balanced more. You follow what I'm saying? These homes today are all built for AC units and central air and heat. They're not built for homesteading. Get this modern mentality out of your head. Get back to yesteryear. These homes that I've built over the years are all built on the homestead mentality. Very modern components. If I had pictures of showing you the inside of it, you'd probably be quite surprised. And maybe someday I'll do that. But the inside of the house is set up. If we have the grid or if you don't have the grid, you still have your nice, of course, we're off grid and we're totally solar. And we'll talk about that as, as we move. Is that your home inside is set up in such a way that your heating system is centralized in the center part of your home. So your kitchen is put in the central part of your home because our wood cook stove is our heating source. And these modern wood cook stoves today are amazing. They're not like yesteryear. These new ones are super efficient and they're amazing size of wood box that you can load it up and it'll be there all night long. Kitchen Queen is the top of the line. They cost a little money, but you'll be blessed more than I can tell you. There's all kinds of them, but Kitchen Queen is the top of the line wood cook stove, and it is amazing. One of the things that we've worked through in these homestead homes is that your, your heating source has to be in the central. Now, you can see the, the chimney up there in the top. Um, it's right near the center part of the home so that when the stove is going, the heat is distributed like this throughout the home. Now the home itself, inside, is all one big open room but the bedroom and the bathroom and the laundry room. And you really don't have to have a lot of heat in those areas. And if you open the door to the bathroom in this home, that heat from the main central home goes right into the bathroom. And it keeps that bathroom really nice and comfortable so you're not chilling when you're taking a bath, all right? Or a shower or whatever. Now, one of the things that we have seen in, in that, that homesteading concept is the, the absolute necessity. And one thing we learned, and I learned this by um, really trial and error, I suppose, is in that home, um, we lived for a number of years uh, amongst the Amish Mennonite people. And if you know anything about these people, one of the things that I kept wondering, this was years ago, how come most of them, at least the communities we lived in or around, why they never had a chimney on the outside of their, their house, their unit? Now, you look a lot of these people in the homesteads, and their chimneys are all on the outside wall somewhere. And I was going like, hmm. I said, what in the world? Why are these people? So I would go snooping, and I would start talking, because these Amish people we were acquainted with were all off-grid people. Uh, they didn't even have solar. And so the first number of years of our homesteading, we were totally off-grid. We were kerosene lamps and everything. And so one of the things we found out as we, we started visiting with some of these people, they told us very clearly, and they've been doing this for hundreds, hundreds of years. This wasn't something new to them. But it was to a lot of us because we grew up in the city. We didn't know anything about homesteading, really. I mean, that was just a house on the prairie thing. 
And so they told me very clearly, says, Ron, we put our chimney in the center of the house because it keeps that chimney from creating creosote. He said, you put it on the outside of the wall, we've had more chimney fires because of that expansion of hot and cold. And when you start a fire in a, a cold chimney, guess where the smoke goes? Into your house. He said that chimney has to get warmed up before it really starts drawing right. So, that's right. And so they said when you keep it in the central part of your house, that chimney stays a lot more um, neutralized in its cold, hot behavior. And when we start fires in the morning, you know, that, that stove doesn't put all the smoke out into your house. And I said, wow, what a thing to learn. It's just a simple little thing that we're not even acquainted with. The other thing they said, we put our chimneys in the central part of our house based on the fact that it keeps the house warm in every direction. So we don't want our bedrooms warm. We want the house where we live warm. We would rather sleep in a cooler bedroom anyways, and that's the way we are as well. So one of the important things about home structure is how that home is built. It doesn't have to be fancy, but it needs to be a home that's built properly. All right, now one of the things that I want to stress to you in, in home structure building is keep it simple. It doesn't have to be nasty, ugly, or anything else. I don't think that house is ugly. I put a lot of art into those homes, and I'll be honest with you. I was a craftsman, and I loved doing woodwork. And so my homes are all post and beam. Absolutely. And I'm going to show you that, ne that next picture. That's a two-story home. That's an 1,800-square-foot home. Two bedrooms upstairs. A full bathroom upstairs. A study upstairs. And downstairs is basically laid out with a bit. It's, it's all open. The living room, the kitchen, the dining room. The entry into the home is all one big open room. All post and beam. It's beautiful. I mean, I, I know I sound like I'm bragging, but I'm sorry. I don't mean to be. I just like something when I build it. When you walk in, you go like, wow, this is nice. And that's what I want because I built my homes to sell. That was my purpose was to build a homestead. That's how I made my living outside of farming is I'd build a homestead, we lived there, get it up, and we took these homes and we sold it and they would sell like that without one real estate agent. Hope there's no real estate agents in here. <laughs> um, because when people came in there, not everybody likes that style, but people have got a homestead mentality that want to live on the land and they have some money, they're going to put it down on it. So that home is a two-story home, and it's, it's, it was built for a family. It's built to where, you know, if you have children, you have it, and if the grid fell apart, you can live and you can survive in that home. One of the things I wanted to say to you all, with this Kitchen Queen stove that's in a central location, these stoves are, are built and made with what's called a convection coil in them. And y'all may not know what a convection coil is, but a convection coil is a, a, a coil that's inside the firebox and it runs by convection. Heat rises as you heat. The pipe that's inside there, that convection coil has water in it. Coming from your water source, and it runs through this, this stove convection coil by convection, meaning that it goes from the lowest point to the highest point. 
And when it reaches its highest point, you know where it goes? To a hot water heater. And that hot water heater is right up above and wherever you want to put it upstairs. And it's all plumbed right into your plumbing system of your water source for hot water. A 50-gallon tank will supply all the water, hot water, you can stand. In fact, that stove will heat water to the point it's almost a boiler. Tick, 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 it will tell you. And it's putting out some serious water, hot water. All right? No electricity involved. Totally, absolutely dependent on water and heat. And you can have all the hot water you want for your bathing or washing or whatever. How do you get the water uh, up to your... Okay, now... When we get to number two, which is your water source, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the importance of setting up your homestead. And when you look at land and you're looking at shelter, you've got to look in your mind when you're looking for land, how the land lays. Where are you going to put your home? Where are you going to put your cookhouse? Where your water source is? How are you going to get your water to your system? And all those things. Because remember, you don't have electricity unless you have solar. Now I can tell you, when we first started out, we did not start out with solar. We were so poor, it was amazing we could rub two pennies together. We spent all of our money escaping the city life and getting away from where my, my doctorate was taking me and my family. That I freaked out and I said, Chris, this is not where I want to be. I don't want these children here. She said, Get, let's go. <laughs> I was very fortunate. And so we spent our money, everything we had, to get to where we are today. Right now, that first picture, you don't see it. Back behind the house, I've got an area which is one of my next projects. We've only been in this, our place for right now, a, a year. And I'm the only one there, so I get to be the one that does all the work, predominantly. Chris helps me, but I'm the one that has to be the, the backbone and run of it. And fortunate or unfortunate, I'm almost 70 years old now, so it doesn't come as easy as it used to, used to be. I'm going to work on building a cookhouse, okay? And it's very important. You may not use it all year. And especially down here, you, you know, you're going to have some very serious weather, hot weather. And even up where we're at, we get enough, enough summer to be miserable which takes me into another area. But yeah, the cookhouse would be back behind the house. You can't see it on these homes. So is it one of the highest? No. I, I built this home for people that were gonna stay on grid. But that house was built for the purpose of, if you wanted to go off grid, it was set up to easily adapt it right over to off grid. This home here, I built for the purpose of resale, period, with the homestead mentality in mind. And that's what the folk, the people we have sold to have all been looking for. They've been looking for a home that if, if they needed to go off grid, they could go off grid real easy. This home was insulated in a fashion to where you would not believe the amount of insulation that's in this house. You've got to think that way when you're when you're living off grid, grandma and grandpa in yesteryear had 15 children, and those children were their workforce. And when they brought firewood up for the, for the winter months, oh my goodness, they had a shelter that would fill this room up nearly. Of wood just to have to cook through the, through the season. And the reason for that is, is they didn't have any insulation. 
didn't necessarily care about the cookhouse, but the main house, when they were cooking through the winter, they had those fires a going. And they would have had more than one fire going in those homes because they did not have it insulated well. These homes in the walls have an R32 in them. Do you know what that means? You, are you a builder? But you know enough about it. Open cell. You can't hardly get R32 in a wall by the common insulation system. It's a two by four wall. You know, if I was further north, I'd go two by six walls. And that'd be an R60 to 65 in the walls. But I'm not in the far north, and so I don't really need it that much. Where you lose most of your heat is right there in the system of the roof system. In my roof system in these homes, it's an R68 to an R70. <laughs> so you know what that means? This house that you see, and the other one as well, in the homes that I've built, it's what is known as a foam insulation. Have you ever heard of that? The foam yes. insulation? They come in there, it's almost like a spray gun, and they spray this house with this spray gun, and it just foams out like this. They come along and they cut it down to the size of your wall, and then you go from there. But when they do this, you don't have your ceiling in your home. You haven't done your sheetrocking and all that stuff, or whatever you're going to do up here. They take this home and they spray it. That house is locked. Everything you heat stays in that house. It doesn't go outside. And every time the sun comes up, the sun stays out there, and the heat stays out there, and your home stays cooler and a cooler and stays cooler for longer through the day. So you've got to think outside the box. It costs you more. It's almost double the amount of cost to have it done, but you've got to think out of the box and, and, and tomorrow. What's going to happen tomorrow? You don't need a big house. That first house you saw, this house is 1,800 square feet for a family. That first house is a 1,000 square foot home, and it's perfect for a couple. Once it seals, it really doesn't. And once you're once you're it's closed in in those walls, it's it's over with. It doesn't leach through the sheetrock or anything else. Now I did some investigating on that because a lot of people were concerned about it. But the stats are, are actually showing more and more homesteaders that are organic-minded people are using it for the very reason why I just told you. <clears throat> They, there is, there is actually a insulation that's being used. It's a blown insulation. It's a cardboard. It's made out of paper. It has a glue type material in it that actually, when they spray it in the walls, it stays. It doesn't compact like this as time goes on as it used to. And this glue actually creates a wall like that. But its R factor is about. 22 R's in the wall versus that 32 to 35 R's. And so I was a little more willing to risk, and I'm an organic freak, so it was really hard for me to get my mind wrapped around using this styrofoam material um, because of that reason. But after looking at a lot of the stats on it, I began to realize you're gonna get more toxicity just out of the environment of your air that you're breathing then you're gonna get out of it because it's locked in. It's just locked in once it's sided and once it's, you know, your house is sheeted and then you've got your sheet rock or whatever you're using as for your walls, that material is just there. And I don't know, I don't know how much it leaches out because I just don't know. And, but I know one thing is you've got to think 
You've got to think very seriously about your insulation factor, how well your home is going to be insulated. Because if you don't, <clears throat> somebody's got to turn this heat off or I'm going to melt down up here. I was using the uh, building blocks, cement blocks. Yeah, it's all, it's, it's got a natural foundation under it, the block, the block foundation. And that was one of the other areas. I'm glad other people are thinking for me. <laughs> Is one of the things with the structure is the importance of how you build that house and one of the things when you build a house at least from a biblical standpoint is you got to think of the foundation when you think of the foundation of your home and yesteryear they put a lot of these homes up on posts and there was a good reason why they did that. I understand because it allowed air to go underneath, but you remember these houses were not insulated. So they were looking for every way they could get to get airflow to keep that house a little cooler. All right? Well, I don't worry about that anymore because we do have the science of insulation. And so when I build these homes, you know, just for your own information, there is a regular foundation block foundation in this house but I build these houses as you can see on some of the pictures you can't see it too well but in these pictures if you look at the wall that's, that's the foam insulation okay that, that's the stuff very good and it's amazing I am not kidding you the, the sound barrier you have alone in these homes when it starts raining on a tin roof, which is another thing we'll discuss here in a little bit, <laughs> on a tin roof, you can't even hardly hear the rain anymore. Wow. And then yesteryear when I started doing this, you know, we just had the fiberglass insulation to use. And when it rained, honey, you couldn't even hardly talk to somebody. <laughs> it was so loud in that house. You go like, come on, Lord, turn the rain off. <laughs> but in these homes, it could rain cats and dogs. And you just don't hardly hear them. So it really is a tremendous sound barrier for your home. With the benefit of super insulation. Thank you. That's, that's good. You can see how they cut it off. Of course, before you do that, you've got to make sure your plumbing and your electric's all done. That's if you're going to go with you know, a solar electricity system. That's all got to be done. Because you can't do it once it's foamed. Everything's got to be done before that. So, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I really should have went from the foundation up. But when we look at the foundation, I want to make sure, you know, in the yesteryear, when we get into this food, food issue, which is the last one, we'll be talking about root cellars. In the yesteryear, Grandma and Grandpa had root cellars, and that's where they kept a lot of their goods down in the root cellar because it kept it neutralized because the temperature of the earth stays pretty stable, all right? In these homes here, instead of building a roof cellar, I had what's called a crawl space. I'd build these houses up tall enough to where you were up tall enough to where you had a nice crawl space that you could get underneath there. You could store all your potatoes. You can store all your, your, your winter squashes. You can store apples, you can store canned goods, all these things, and you got this whole space just going to waste. And I said, this is nuts. So I, I had a guy come to me when I was building this, building this home. He said, man, the only thing I don't like about this home is too high up in the air. I said, well, I said, the reason why I put it that way and he says, why is that? And I already had it built like this. And he said, that's the only thing I don't like. I don't like to have to come up these long, old, tall steps. And I said, well, I says, come with me. And I took him around there to the, the, the crawl space door. And he looked underneath there and he says, oh, my. <laughs> I had five-gallon buckets of food enough to last for five years under there. Because what happens in the basement 
or in the crawl space. Oh, son, you could crawl under and go to sleep in the summer. It's like air conditioner under there. And in the winter months, because of your heating in your home, I don't insulate the floor in my homes because that heat radiates into the crawl space enough to keep anything from freezing. And so you've got this really neat situation because it's going to be wasted space one way or the other. So if you build it with your mind thinking, let's build it up tall enough to use it as a root cellar. Okay, that's the so you just have the food sitting there on the ground, or do you have? Well, I have plastic. You know, you you put the plastic on the on the ground, you know, to keep any kind of moisture from ever coming up or whatever. But I have it either in bins or in buckets or in, in like like onions, for instance. I will take onions, and I got it tall enough up off the ground to where I have nails in the floor joists spaced out. And I'll take my onions that I've dried in the barn or the garlic, and I'll take it and hang it up in, the, in those floor joists. And it's just laying there in these baskets. And when we run out of onions up top, I go down there and get another bag of onions. And those onions will be there until you run out of onions. Same thing with potatoes and a lot of other goods. You can put your, your bins, like carrots, for instance. See, I'm running way ahead. I'm having a hard time staying on track. You can take and build these bins in these crawl spaces, but these crawl spaces have got to be tall enough so that you can get in there and be comfortable with it. And, and work with it. Shade for the home? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we'll talk about that one too, I guess. You just remind me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How's that? Okay. So. So when we talk about the shelter, you, you, you know, and you may already have a lot of these things down, but there's folks that may not. So you have to think outside the box. When you do what you're doing, you think, you know, if the, if the grid system never melts down, you know, the thing that's amazing to me, when I started doing this and started insulating our homes this way, I went to the electric company and they told me plain out, I said, that's the smartest thing you can do in a home right there. It saves you 35% over your year's period of time of your electric bill. If you're staying on grid, you may spend money to insulate it really high tech insulation. But over that period of time, they actually say within four years, you've paid for your insulation just by what you save on your electric bills. Okay. What if you lose of, of this insulation to the windows, the doors, what can you do? Well, all my windows and all my doors are E windows and E doors. That means that they are gassed, they're double pane, and there's a gas in between those two panes that actually create an insulation factor to where you don't lose a lot of heat or a lot of cold through them. The doors are built the same way with high factor insulation factor. Now, another thing within these homes that we have done is we use, and especially for the summer months and also the winter months, is we have what's called insulated blinds. Okay, they're a curtain-like material, and they're nice looking, they're not ugly, and there's companies that manufacture these things, and you can pull them back like a drape or like a, you know, a tall, I like a tall window because in our homes, one of the things I can't help but stress is you don't want a dark, dreary home. And if you look at these homes, you'll see the long, tall, five-foot window, and they're three foot wide, by five foot tall, and that allows a lot of sunshine in, and you see where the porches are built. It's on the front and the back of both of our homes. You don't get direct sunlight that's just baking you. When that sun comes down, it hits the porch, 
And it doesn't go through your window into your house to heat your house up. But you get the light that if you don't need to be using electricity, you get the daylight in your homes. So there's a lot of light in these homes. But if it gets hot, like in the late afternoon, for instance, you pull those drapes down, even though your windows may be open. And I recommend in your opening it in, the, in the way your house is built, shut the windows in the afternoon, open the windows in the afternoon on the other side of your house. Don't let the heat into your home in the afternoon. The cooler air will come in from your open sides where your sun is not going to be. You follow that? Same thing in the morning. Think, think out of the box. Think no electricity. Think no AC. Okay? Think that way. Get your head wrapped around it. In the morning, what are you going to do? That on the west side of your house, your windows are going to be open. And on the east side of the house, your windows are going to be shut. You're going to may have them on the ends here open because you're going to get circulation in there. But you build it to where that house is set up, just like Grandma and Grandpa would have done it, to where you have to manually control your environment. You don't have AC on the wall anymore. All right? A lot of these things, and I know it may get a little boring, <laughs> But we've got to think these ways again. We've got to go back to yesteryear. We've got to get out of this mindset of where we put ourselves. Yeah, in my house, uh, I, we bought a uh, bubble, bubble wrap. Bubble oh, yes, wrap, yes, yes, yes. Put them in the window. Then the window that the sun heat, I didn't put nothing in here. Good. And I see the difference in the bill. Oh, absolutely. And you understand what he said? In your windows, there is a bubble, a bubble wrap insulation. And I've known people, I'm glad you brought that up, because there's just too much to deal with in my poor little brain. <laughs> is different folks, like, like he has done, they take this double wrap, and there's a, a, a different ways of doing it. You can build, I know people that have built like an um, insulated um, panel and they take those panels and they put it away when they don't need them. And they take these panels and they have drilled holes in your woodwork. You can't see them hardly, but they're nice little pin. They put these panels into the, into the window from the inside and they pin it in two places, or, you know, here and here. And they put these panels in there with this insulated factor. They use styrofoam, you know, this really thick styrofoam material. It's about an inch and a half thick. And some of them use the double wrap, and it knocks that heat out. And if, you got, if you're in, in super cold climate, you do the same thing to keep the cold out. And then you can take them down during the day when the sun's a shining and all the rest of it. But you've got to think, I, I cannot stress it enough to you folks, you've got to think outside of the box because that box is just about ready to get blasted. How do you call that? What's that? How do you call it then? Styrofoam. Well, it's, uh, it's called bio, uh, it's a bubble wrap or a styrofoam. You can buy these styrofoams in four by eight sheets. You can get it at Lowe's or Home Depot, and it's about an inch and a half thick. And it's got like an R15 to an R20 in it. And you can take that and make these panels, cut them out, that'll sit right inside that glass window, and you just pin it, and it's there. And I'm telling you, the difference, I really could give you a hug, that was a good thought. <laughs> that, that panel, will absolutely save the heat. If you're heating your home in the winter months, you don't want all that heat going out your window. All right, so those are just things that you've got to think. Just, just remember, yesteryear and tomorrow may not be the same. We may wake up one day and America will no longer be America. At least not America that we've all grown up in.
Yes, ma'am. Question and answer at the end. Okay. No, no. So my cousins, um, she's my first cousin. She's 11 years older than me. Her and her husband are now retired. Moved away from Oklahoma to Florida. Mm -hmm. And they have two children. And they have a Myself. <laughs> That's hard for me to do. <laughs> I don't like A frames for many different reasons. An A frame is a house that looks like that. They go right straight to the to the ground or to your foundation. Look, what's that? Oh, they they they. Well, they serve their purpose, but so does this or. Is it? One of the things I don't like about it is you lose a lot of, of space. You just lose a lot of space. You get over here, you're busting your head on the wall over here because it goes right down here. So what are you going to put over there against that wall? you got to get way out here in that house. And I've been a builder for years. When you, you I mean, you just... You lose this space. And so you've got to build an A-frame house that goes way up there just to get living space right down here. And I says, you're not really saving a whole lot by going to that level. You know, a lot of, honestly, a lot of people build A-frame houses because they don't know anything about building. And I'm just being honest. Because it's, it's, I'm going to say something. You're just going to have to throw your books at me. A-frame houses are for dummies. <laughs> I, I agree. I think that they didn't know anything about building. And I say that kindly, and I don't mean it to hurt anybody, but it's simply because they don't know anything about building. So they, they take lumber, and they go like this with it, and they tie it together up here, and all of a sudden, they've got a structure. Well, fine, if that's all they want to do, you know, and they're going to live in this thing for who knows how long. And then when you go to have a space up top, you know what you end up up here with? A loft. You, you end up with not very much at all. You just don't have room. Most people that I've known that lived in A-frame houses get claustrophobic after a while because they just don't have space. I've built homes for the purpose of living in. I want my wife, I think not myself, because I don't live in that house. I live outside. I'm the one that produces the food. I'm the one that lives predominantly my life outside the house. My wife and my children predominantly live in that house. My children are all homeschooled. I had to build a home that made my family feel comfortable and being at home. Amen. And so that's just my own my own heart to heart. And I also am a fanatic. I like to something to look at and say, you know, that's a nice looking place. Sorry. <laughs> you know, so and because like I was telling you before, and I don't know if you're in here or not, but I built all of our places for resale, and I wanted to be very functional, and I wanted to work to where people could be comfortable in it. When they walked into it, they felt like it was a very spacious. You can walk into that thousand square foot home, the first picture I showed you, and you have no idea it's a thousand square foot home because it feels much larger. Because the openness of it and the space that you have in that little home. There's not a lot of walls, and that's one thing I can't stress enough. 
is when you build a home, be careful that you don't box yourself in. That boxing yourself in is going to be very detrimental on the way the airflow of that house is. Minimize your... So when we was in that house there, did you have a bathroom? Yes. Yes. And a lot of times we had more than family there. I mean, we've, we've had kind of an open door policy. <laughs> and we had people coming and going all the time. So when we sold this place and built our last place, I hope and pray I don't have to move again. Or have to. Or want to. Or do. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's a comfortable place for a single a husband and a wife. You know, situation. Let's see. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There's eleven main windows, and in the back, right through those windows, there is the living room, and right beyond the living room is the dining room. In the dining room, there is a double set of doors, French doors. There's um, these two, that's the master bedroom right there. That's the, the living room there. There's a window around there in that corner that goes into the living room. And then down from there, there's a window in the other corner that goes into the dining room. And then around here, there's another window that goes into the bedroom. And the next window here is the bathroom, all right? And then around that comes the, uh, the laundry room in the laundry room, there's a door with a window in it going outside. And then you come from there. It's the kitchen. The kitchen is centralized right in the center of the home right here. You can't see the chimney on this one, but the, the, the kitchen's right in the center. And right at the sink is there is another window going right straight out. And then up top on both ends here is a, is a window here and a window here. <laughs> bedroom up here, bedroom over there. Bathroom up there in the middle at the top of the stairs, straight up. And then there, right next to the bathroom is a study. So that's about 12 windows? About 12 windows or so, yeah. So lots of, lots of window, lots of air space, you know, circulation for air and all those good things. What could be the price of such a house? What's that? The price of this house. How much does it cost to build that house? Well, because I built it, and I had no labor cost, but the, whatever I was doing, you got about $100,000 into it. And that's turnkey. Without the labor. That's without any labor. I had very little labor cost. The labor cost that I had in this house was the people that came and ran the insulation, and, a few, and, the, and the guys that did the metal roofing. Now, that's one thing I want to talk to you about is the metal roofing. When you do these homes, you want to think about tomorrow because when we talk about water source, you want a roof system that will catch water. You don't want these, these, these shingles that are being used today. Of course, they've taken asbestos out of them. But what they do is they break down over a period of time and all those little particles of those shingles end up in your water storage unit. And it poisons your water. You don't want that. You think outside the box, go back to grandma and grandpa, they all had metal roofs. And now we're blessed with metal roofs that you can get a paint on there that are a 35 to 40 year warranty. They will not, it just will not break down. What about a tile roof? Well, tile, you can go tile, but we gotta think really heavy about the tile roof system. They're really great, but they're very, very, very expensive. Changes the structure of the whole. The whole, the whole structure of your rafter system up here has radically gotta change because when you go to that heavy, that heavy, I know in California where I grew up, they used a lot of that tile because it was, a, it was a nice way of somewhat insulating the heat out of that California 110 degree weather. But when they built the rafter system, there was superstructure. 
<laughs> because you had this weight, I mean big time weight. So I got away from the heavy work of tile and I've done some of that years and years ago and I did not like it at all. So I went to the metal roofing in all my homes and when I built my homes, I like to build them to where you can't really see the color per se. Is the color, I wanted a color that was kind of a neutral color, so I used burnished slate on our, our roof systems. But it's a paint structure, like I said, 35 to 40 years. You know where you're going to be in 35 to 40 years? You're going to be where the mansions were built by somebody else. Amen. 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 But now that we're still back on earth, unfortunately, <laughs> you want to you want to build a roof system that will catch water and stay non-toxic. All right. And metal roofing is very, very important. And so in all of my homes, I've always built roof systems that will catch water. You can see there's gutters up top and there's gutters down below. It catches every bit of that water. And they're the, they're the industrial size gutters, not the little BDO four inch ones, they're like six, six and something inches, gutters, and they catch water, and you channel it around, as you can see as the gutters come down, you channel it around, and you run it into a storage tank underground. Okay, it's, everybody that's getting into homesteading, I set this place up, for the people that bought it, if they wanted to put that system in, they were more than welcome to do it. Now, I wasn't going to go to the expense of putting it in this home because I was going to sell it. But it was built to where it would catch water. If you have a spring or a well, you had all the water back up. Let me tell you, as we come into that second section, I cannot stress the importance of having water. You cannot have too much water in storage for the use of your homestead. So when we talk about structures, there's all these things to look at. Question, when you catch so much water, you get underground storage, you gotta keep it from going bad. I mean, the water's staying, water will go bad in about three days. Yeah. Most people that use an underground water system, of course they're using tanks now that are developed that are non-toxic tanks and if you bury them in the ground and you keep light from them they'll it'll last longer we used to have a cistern in one of our homes that it was a 3,000 gallon cistern and we of course we were totally off grid there and we had a hand pump that was right near that cistern to where it was on a, on a counter unit to where we could take our, our bowls or whatever we wanted, our bucket, and we go, you've seen that in a picture somewhere, probably in a movie or something, but that's what we did. And it would come right out of that cistern. And we were always using that cistern, and, you, and, it, and it's built like, the, like this system is a little more modern than what we had when we started out with this, but it was built, I mean, y'all live back here in the south, you know how much rain we get here? When it rains at least once a week around this country, what's going to happen to that cistern? It's going to fill up. And if it's going to fill up, you better have an overflow. You take that overflow and you run it to somewhere where it just runs away. That's going to help keep that water clean. Now, some people get concerned about that. I don't, because I think we become too sanitary about everything we do. I would rather see you get a little bit of bacteria that builds your immune system than you'd be so freaked out that you lock yourself in a bubble. You know what I'm saying? And so, I don't get concerned. Now, the state will get all bit out of shape at you when we get into this water issue about you know, water, that you better make sure you have chlorinated tablets. Well, let me tell you something. I'd rather take a little bit of bacteria than I take that chlorinated water down my gullet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, the, the house that we currently live in was built in 2005, but it was built in 1993. It's always been on the well. First of all, the well never goes dry. I mean, it's always plenty. And um, my husband actually is like a computer guy at the large strip where he's sick. Um, he sends out a guy, well, we didn't do it for two years, but when I had my baby in 2007, because I was breastfeeding, he sent out a guy. 
Yeah. And why not? The guys can come and do it for free for us. And we've never had any problems with our water. I'm not saying in the future we won't, yeah. but I'm just saying there's no huge bacteria problems and no I, When I mentioned that, I was mainly referring to water storage right. in tanks, but it's amazing what I don't know where you where you're at, and so you just have to forgive me. I just talk what I feel in my heart. God has created a most wonderful filtering system for wells or for springs that you can't duplicate. And so those waters, and there are methods when we get into talking about water, we're going to talk about different methods of filtration. All right? But back to this before I close up. I don't know. How long I'm supposed to go? When am I supposed to hush? Twelve? Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, if you need to take just a few more minutes break, you can take a break. I'm okay. I'm okay. I think. Now, when we talk about structure, I know there's a lot of things to look at when we're talking about the structures of your homestead home. And I'm just kind of trying to hit some of the, the, the basics for you. You may not want a style like this. You may want some other kind of style or some other kind of look. One of the things I did with these homes is I have siding on these homes that you have next to no maintenance on. You got to think, what am I gonna do about this siding when it starts cracking all up because I used wood siding? What am I gonna do when this vinyl siding starts cracking up because it's getting older? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I went to the expense to go with what's called hardy board. Anybody in here familiar with hardy board? Oh, it's wonderful stuff. You know, it's a cement board, is what it amounts to, with fiber in it. But it's non-toxic, and it will not fire. I mean, if there ever was a fire anywhere around, it can hit the side, and it'll never ignite. I mean, it's wonderful stuff, and you've got years and years and years of it being there. Literally. It's on the outside, it's your, it's your siding, and it's got a nice look to it. It's got a nice lap siding look. It's even got a wood grain in it. It looks like wood. And yet it's there for years, and once you stain it or paint it with a proper paint, it's there for 15 years. You don't have to do anything with it after that if you've done it right. So, and it's... it's you know, you just want to think those ways. When you build a place, or you're, you know, you may not be building a place. You may be just looking for a place, and we need to cover that a little bit, too. If you're, you're buying some place that's already developed, what to look for and what not to look for. But those things you need to really consider. And remember, you know, try to keep it orderly as much as you possibly can. You have your secondary house, that is your cookhouse that's outside of your, your main home structure for the use of those summer months of cooking your meals and preparing your meals. And it also may become known as your what house. When we get down there to the, the, the your food production, what are you gonna use that cookhouse for? Canning. That's right, canning, preparation. Getting these food things prepared to put into storage. And you want to do all that outside of your house to keep your house from getting overheated. Alright? So that secondary house, which is your, your, your cook house, or your canning house, or your processing house, which serves for so many different things, is very, very important to a homestead structure. Now... With this homestead structure, think when you look for land for your homestead, make sure you find a place on that homestead that's on a higher elevated piece of ground. 
It doesn't need to be super elevated, but just elevated enough to where all your rain or whatever excess will flow away from your house. I don't like building on super elevated land. I just like to build on a, a piece of land that has enough rise to it. You know, and it doesn't have to be much of a rise, but just enough rise to, so your water doesn't sit around your house or around your structures, because that's gonna create mold, it's gonna, it's gonna create disease, it's gonna create all kinds of problems so make sure that house structure and your secondary house structure is at least a bit elevated from the rest of your land if possible. You don't want to build a house with a mountain sitting in behind you like this because that rain's going to come down off that mountain and you know where it's going to end up. Yes. Right in your yard. <laughs> and eventually in your house because it will suck the land with moisture, and that moisture will find its way underneath your house. Very good. She's asking what kind of acreage um, do you go with? Depends on what you want. Uh, to be honest with you, you don't need any more than five acres. What did you buy? What did I buy? I bought 70 acres. <laughs> when I first started and I left my private practice, I bought five acres. I started with five acres and we had, well, I'm, you ask me questions and I want to jump over to another subject. <laughs> My poor brain, because when I looked at land, I surveyed the land. That's what I do. I walk it from corner to corner. I want to know what's out there and what's on that piece of land. I get it down and I go like this. I take the dirt and I smell it. I want to know what that soil's like. I dig into the ground. I take a shovel with me. And I checked the land out before I put a penny on that land. Because that land means everything to me. The way it sits, how it sits, what's there, what is the natural resources we have. You don't want to buy a piece of junk that you're going to suffer your life ahead of you on. Because it's, it's hard enough work in and of itself, folks. You don't want to make a time of trouble for yourself before the time of trouble comes. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you something. You want a time of trouble, you go out there and do stupid. Because we, we bought five acres when we first started. And I had an acre piece of ground of that five acres that we gardened on. Now, you saw the pictures and we will get there again. You need more than an acre of ground to produce enough food for yourselves over that year's period of time. But we started out that way. How do you keep uh, wildlife from destroying the crops? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then we had a real good dog. Every homestead needs a good dog. That dog is amazing. I don't believe in watch dogs, at least of keeping people away from my place. But I like a watchdog that stays up at night watching the critters. <laughs> and we had some mighty fine dogs. And I'll tell you what, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have deer, coon, or anything in our gardens. Because that boy hated those critters. Mm -hmm. And he would kill every last one of them. And I said, go for it. <laughs> because they'll clear your crop out. And that's food for your family. That's food, that's food for tomorrow. And for the next year or whatever. And you can't afford to be out there laboring and working as hard as I have done over the years and still try to. To let them come in there and do that to you. 
So my recommendation in the sense of how do you keep the critters out, get you a good dog, get you a really good dog that has some good training, spend some money on a good dog because it's worth every penny of it. It really is. What kind of a dog? Well, there's all kinds of them. I'm not going to give you any recommendation. <laughs> We, we use a number of different ones over the years. They don't have to be a big dog. They just need to be a dog that has enough fight in it to say, uh-uh, we're not putting up with you. All right? Okay, so we do the, like, about an acre and a half of garden. But the main problem we have um, is blueberry, like the blueberry bushes. We have 10 large blueberry bushes. So this is a trick you can do because the birds, I mean, you're not going to kill all the birds. But to keep on track, let's stay with shelter as much as possible. I am having a hard time doing the same thing, folks. So <laughs> when we deal with structure and we're talking about your homestead, keep in mind those things that we've, we've discussed. And when you set up your homestead, set it up to where your secondary home is as close to your main home as possible because you don't want it. And if at all possible, create it close enough to what the old homesteads were like that you had a breezeway between. Because when it's raining, you don't want to have to go walking through the trudge over to the cookhouse or whatever. Or, or you know what I mean? So just kind of create it. Now, if you do not have the ability to build and you may not have the finances, maybe even the time to do it or have it done, then what are you going to do? <laughs> I'm going to tell you one thing not to do. Do not buy a mobile home. <laughs> Period. You're better off going and getting a mini barn and living in it and insulate it and do that. These mobile homes are not made for homesteading. I'll just tell you that right here and now. You cook to death in the summer, and you can't hardly keep them cool enough in the summer, and you're going to die inside there. And in the winter, it's really tough. It's not as tough as it is in the summer, but those mobile homes are just not made for homesteading. So when you look for something, and you're looking out in the country, remember, we're thinking about getting out of the cities, getting out of the, the villages, and getting into the country, as this once was, and no longer is. Look for a home that is suitable, and when you look at a home that is suitable, make sure you spend some time investigating that home underneath, the foundation of it, is there mold in the, in the structure? Make sure that you check this house out really well because you're going to have to live in it. And here in the South, mold is a big problem. You do not want to be living in a house of breathing mold spores. It will destroy your health. Well, I, from Walmart, <laughs> 500 miles from Walmart. Yeah. I do not like Walmart, as you just picked up. <laughs> just think, Walmart is going to be the New World Order store. You will not be able to go in that store without a mark and without a card that gives you the right to buy and sell. That store is set up 
in such a manner that no stores have ever been set up with. Sam Walton was a 32nd degree Mason. And he is in bed with this system. And that whole store system has been set up. If you know anything about Walmart, you will quit going to Walmart. I do not like supporting that system at all. Now, my wife isn't quite convicted like I am. I do not go into Walmart. I do not like, so get me off that one. Now, my personal opinion is you need enough space from a neighbor that you don't have to see them and you don't have to them see you as much as possible. You want enough privacy. That doesn't mean they have to be long, long, long ways away, but you want privacy between your neighbors. It is possible. It's not real easy. Nothing homesteading is easy. I'll tell you right. It says, what did it say? Where is it? Homestead made simple. I started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, doggies, there's no simplicity about it. It is tough. It is a lot of work, and it takes a lot of determination. It takes a lot of guts, and it takes a lot of conversion. But it is not simple. As a believer in what the word says, I know there's coming a time that's called a great time of trouble, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. We know that that time's coming, but we don't need to make a time of trouble for ourselves before it is. I think we are a living witness to our neighbors. We need to set up an ark, as I told you that first night, Friday night, Noah was given a commission to build an ark. He didn't go hide. He was a living witness to his neighbors in hopes to bring salvation to them. He didn't want to be like his neighbors, did he? I don't, I don't think we need to be isolationists. I'm not into that. I don't think we belong as believers, as isolationists. We need to be a living witness. But I do believe our witnesses, and every time we swing that hammer like Noah did, it told a story. What you're doing on the land, believe me, people are watching you with hawk eyes. They're watching what you're doing. They're watching to see whether you are, are a, a hypocrite. Or you really believe what you say. Do you know what I'm saying? So your neighbors, I don't know how to tell you how far to be, be, be away from your neighbors. I want to be so far away from neighbors, I'd like to be a hermit. <laughs> but the Lord told me to do something otherwise, and he got me to come down here, didn't he? <laughs> I disappeared for years. I, this is the first time I've been in anywhere to speak in over near 12 to 15 years. But somehow the Lord, by some sister sitting over there, <laughs> called me and asked me if I would do it. And you would not believe what happened to me when she called me. <laughs> I said, Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> so I don't know how far you should be away from your neighbors. I'm just saying you need to be a living witness to your neighbors. What you do on your piece of land, whatever the size of it is, needs to be orderly. It needs to be attractive. And it needs to be a testimony every time you swing that hammer like Noah did that it told the story of the everlasting gospel. Amen. How did you deal with COVID? Of what? COVID, COVID. You were in the time of COVID, were you? Oh, Several I didn't even know there was such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the truth. We never, we never dealt with it. I mean, we lived and lived like we'd always been living and I mean, I don't know if anybody in this room knows anything about Y2K. 
Now, y'all are old enough to know what Y2K was. You remember what happened in Y2K? Yeah. Oh, man, everybody was freaking out. Yeah. Everyone was about, the end of the world's coming. The grid's are melting down. And the computer system's going to be wiped out. You remember that? We didn't know a thing about it. We'd been living this way. And people would come to us and say, Ron, why are you living this way? I said, because I love living this way. So you didn't do it because of Y2K? I said, man, we've been doing this for years. We didn't know any Y2K. We didn't care. Our whole grid system could break down and fall apart, and we still just kept plugging along. On this home here, we did not, but I set it up for it. If the people wanted to put the money into it, they could. No, the home I'm at now... Let me jump real quick and I'll show you. You weren't here the other evening. You know how to go backwards? <laughs> Getting a view of all this stuff we're going to talk about later. Wait, I'm right there. Okay, that first house I showed you on this picture, that smaller home, that's what we have as a solar system. And we're going to talk about solar a little bit when we, we start looking at it. But if, if, if you want electricity, it's available. But you don't have to be hooked to the grid. Well, so the question I have with, these, with solar, as far as people putting it on their roofs, people getting leaks in the roof, and that's generally... Stay off the roof. Yes. Yeah. And the other question is uh, maintenance and storage for energy. Yes. So do you have a battery? Absolutely. Let's deal with that right now so I won't have to come back to it because you brought it up, all right? Because it's dealing with your home's homestead structure. You've got to think, my time is up, but I'm going to hit it anyways. If, and if you don't want to be in, you, you're welcome to go. Now, um, when we talk about energy or your homestead, you've got to put it in your mind. How are you going to, how are you going to have the lights? How are you going to have this, that, and the other? You know, we lived for four years, four to five years, when we first bought our bigger place. And we were totally kerosene. We were totally off-grid, kerosene lamps and the whole nine yards, bumping into walls when you didn't have a way to turn lights on. Well, we eventually converted that place over to a solar system, which was very primitive. But it worked for lights. We couldn't use a whole lot. Well, eventually... Over the time, we were able to save up enough money by our building and buying and selling and all those things to where we have enough money to build a proper solar system. In this solar system, we have 4,800 watts per hour being produced. Y'all know what that means? You can run anything you want to run, all right? There's 10 panels up there. You can't see them all. And those 10 panels are all hooked into a brain that's inside. At the end of that, there's a little building sitting down here where the brain, the inverter, the, the, the power control, uh, uh, all that is in there. And there's a battery bank system in there that has a huge amount of, of storage. When we went through six days of gray weather, these panels are bifacial. You know what bifacial means? That means on the top side, the power that's coming from the sun hits them. Underneath where you see my rototiller and all those things, when this picture was taken, I hadn't finished what we started out to. Under, all those are out of there now. And on the base of that, on the ground, are all painted white rocks. And when the sun shines and hits that white, or my houses are more of a whitish color, the sun hits the house and bounces off into those white rocks, and it goes right, boom, right to the top of the bottom of those solar panels. They're called bifacial. Oh, my God. 35% more energy we're gaining every day by just that alone. It's picking it up from the bottom. It's bouncing off those white rocks 
and it comes, it bounces off the house, lands down on the ground into those white rocks, and bounces out of those white rocks right to the bottom of those panels, and we're gaining 35% more energy in our solar production by just that alone. Okay? The sun that's coming down like this without bouncing at the house, it comes right underneath and about half of the rocks right here in the winter months, which is your most important, mm -hmm. your winter months because your sun is way down here. It comes down here like this and you know where it's going? Right underneath the solar panels. And it hits those white rocks and doom, up it goes. And so when we went through four or five days of gray weather, whatever we wanted to do, we were doing. Because our solar system was set up in a way, and there's, there's techniques and, and, and how to set that solar system up. You want that degree of the way those panels are setting at a 32 degree in our territory. I don't know what it would be down here, probably about 30. But we up there is 33 degrees, and 32 to 33 degrees, and it lays it down, and that means we're getting ultimate sun in the winter months. Summer, we don't care. We got full summer goes right over the top. And another thing about solar is you want to make sure the direction those solar panels are headed. You want them, that's exactly right, you want them to run east to west. And you want your panels to be safe. So when you're looking for a piece of land, think these things. You want those panels to be looking which way? To the south. At the sunshine. Because the sun falls in the winter months to the, to the south. And as far as it goes, you want to make sure that your clear land back here that you're not getting sunshine when that sun falls back down here. You follow me? And let me tell you, these new panels are an absolute amazing, amazing what they do. is a white pine tongue and groove. All right, non-toxic, just pine flooring. And it's the old fashioned type. When you walk in this house, you thought you went back 150 years. With all new components, we got a refrigerator, beautiful refrigerator in our homes, and it runs around the clock because of the solar system. We don't even know we're on the solar, to be honest with you. I mean, that was the thing with soda. Chris goes to the kitchen when she wants to use the blender, when she wants to bake bread, whatever she wants to do. I set this home up for my wife. I don't need all these things. I can live in a, in a hut. Deep freeze, we've got two deep freezes. And we've got all the conveniences that a woman needs, washer machine and all those things in this house, but totally off grid. Yeah, did you do the installation yourself? Or? No, I hired. I hired a company that was up in our area, and it's all over now. They will come out, and you know they'll give you an estimate, and they'll tell you, and then they'll come out one day, and it depends on the size of the house. Now I tell you right off, I'm going to say it again: be humble and be simple. Build a very nice, simple home that's attractive. You don't need a great big home. Okay, that's exactly right. That's the simplicity. And when they come out and blow that place, that house, that house right there cost us, this is, well, this is the house I'm in right now. Okay, with the solar system. That house cost us $3,800 to be insulated. And the solar system? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. How much? No, 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 no. 
I got about twelve thousand dollars into my system, and that's nice. That's a good price. The solar system. I've got about twelve. Just a little under thirteen thousand dollars into our solar system. That's everything. That's everything. How big is that house? This house is a thousand square foot, but this solar system that I have right now would have easily worked for that eighteen hundred square foot home. <laughs> this one here is a thousand square foot. It's got a master bedroom in it. It could have had two bedrooms. We didn't want it because it's just mom and I now. And it has a master bedroom with the bathroom. It has one bed bathroom. We don't need the two bathrooms anymore. The 1,800 square foot home had a full bathroom upstairs and a full bathroom downstairs. It has, it has the, the master bedroom downstairs in the big house. And then it had that full open kitchen in the middle, wood cook stove in the middle. And then the dining room and living room, and then upstairs, it had the two bedrooms off to the side like this with the bathroom right straight at the head of the stairs. And it was all electrified completely, and all you had to do is to put the solar system in and hook it in, and it would have been totally off-grid. Now, the little home, it's the exact same, you'd almost think you walked into the, 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 the bigger home. Because the downstairs is exactly the same as the big home was because we liked the, the functionality of it. We liked the way it felt and worked. The washroom, you know, in our washroom, another thing I want to hit real quick is in that structure of your house, of the one you're living in, not your secondary house, but your home, you want a room in there for mama to have a pantry. You don't want to be going somewhere to pick up king goods or whatever you're going to have. So in my washroom where the washing machine is in a wash tub to wash your hands and stuff, on the opposite wall of where the washing machine is, that whole wall is full of shelves. And it's built in such a manner that we can put all of our canned goods. I mean, we used to be putting up about 1,200 to 1,500 canned goods a season. All right? And then we had five gallon buckets all the way along the wall. There's a, it's an eight foot shelf wall system. These five gallon buckets full of bulk food. And then you go down to the crawl space. Guess what? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so you had your home structure and that's, you know. Are those panels a maintenance fee? Oh, absolutely. The what? When you set them, one of the things I can go forever. <laughs> when, when you're dealing with solar, when you set it at its proper angle, if you get hail, it'll bounce off those things and roll right on. All right, they're very tough. It takes some serious abuse. And the way I've got them set up, they're easy to change out anyways. It's, it's, no, it's not difficult at all. Very maintenance free. Now, with that addition, I, I don't know what y'all do down here in the winter months, whether you get snow or not, but where we are, we get snow. And so you have to have yourself set up enough to go out there every day, get snowing and wipe the snow off. That's why you don't want it on your roof. You don't want to go up on top of that roof. Even you get the risk of the holes in the roof, there's ways of, there's, there, there's caulking now that's unbelievable. It will last you your lifetime with one application. But you, my opinion is keep them off the roof, get them down to where you can manage them and handle them. And the other thing of it is you put them on the roof, you lost your by face. You lost the, 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 the ability to get 35% more, cent, percent more from the bottom. All right, keep them on the ground as low as possible and utilize everything you've got. Now, believe me, this is an exp not expensive, but the simpler you keep your structure, the less expense you're gonna have in this. But what if you can't afford solar? 
You know what I mean? I mean, we got enough people in here I know good and well is not going to be able to shovel out $12,000 on a solar system. So what are you going to do? Set yourself up completely off-grid to where when the time comes, when you don't have electricity, you can still function. You know what I mean? Have kerosene lights, put them away somewhere, have five, six, ten gallons of kerosene that'll last you probably a couple of years or your lighting structure alone. That's what we used to do. When we started out homesteading, I had 15 gallons of kerosene set aside in my shop, and that's what would replenish our light. And that would last us a year to some up to two years. So you can have that. I want to know. We know people that have done cement and they painted the cement with a real good industrial white paint and that works just as fine. You can use metal roofing that's white and you can lay it down, make sure it's pinned down. Anything that's white, or white works the best because it reflects the best. Now you can use just silver. I don't like the silver because it wants to rust. Yeah, there, I mean, there's all kinds. I mean, believe me, you can get on the internet now, and there is so much stuff out there now of people that have an interest of being off grid. Okay. Oh, let me go here first. Sorry. Can a system like this be added to an existing home? Absolutely. Um, and it's very easy to do, it's not that complicated. Because you're already set up. Your power is coming into your 200 amp box as it is. All right? All you're doing is you're telling the electric company, and now. <laughs> when I built this home, this is the dream place that my wife and I have wanted. We just didn't have the money to do. What we really wanted to do, I wanted to set Chris up with a place that she had home and where she was comfortable and she could do without all the slave labor that we had during those early years. It was a lot of work. So when I built this home, the electric company really got upset with me because I built it up because they thought I was going to tie into their grid system. We have the grid right there, and it was already at our barn because the man that we bought it from had the power at the barn. The power company says, well, do you want us to run a pole up there? I said, no. He said, well, how are you going to have power? I said, solar. That was it. I said, this home is not going to be tied into your system. If you do solar, you've got to make your mind up. You either go solar or you don't. Because what they do is they've got it set up universally in this country that if you go on grid and you go solar, your solar goes to them. And they give you back, no, they give you back your electricity for whatever that worth. Double the price. What's that? Double the price. Double the price. Oh, I love you, brother. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. That's right. I talk to them, but they don't let me to be independent. That's right. I have to pay to them and to the power plant too. That's right. You, when you, when you think of this stuff, folks, 
you're all right. <laughs> when you think of this, you've got to think outside the box. If you're going to do this, you make your mind up and you do it. Because if you tie to the system, you're sunk. You're sunk. You cannot just go out there and cut the line and say, I'm going solar. You either cut the line and go solar or you don't do it at all. Because you don't have that kind of freedom by going on the grid and trying to be off grid, so if you know what I'm saying. Basically, they have control when we, time. They have control of you. Why are you do why do you want to homestead? This is the whole reason why we've come down here and we're talking about this. If you want to stay in the world, stay there and enjoy yourself until Sodom and Burns. But you've got to make up your mind. If you're going to go this way, you've got to get your heads on and think, it. okay, honey, we're going. You ready? But you can do it and have a good life and never have Uncle Bill ever again. You, you follow me? You want to say goodbye, Uncle Bill? What do you do every month? Uncle Bill comes to the door, doesn't he? <laughs> Do you have the name of that company? The solar, solar company? Solar company? Well, I mean, there's a number of them. You know, like they to be, uh, I did this myself. There wasn't a solar company. So, that's what I said. you say there was a company? I, well, there's companies all over. Get on the, get on the internet. And, and look up solar, you know, I mean, there's companies all over this, all over the place. They carry all your inverters, they, they will carry your batteries, they will carry all the brain work, all your solar panels and all that. They, they will carry it. If you want to dig into your pocket, because that's what it's going to take. But if you want to be off grid, there are companies that have all this material all over the country now. When we started, huh, it was like going to a foreign country. So basically, basically the system cost you thirteen thousand yeah. dollars, but you installed it yourself. Is that right? <coughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. But then it costs even more if you have someone to do it. I had an Adventist friend of mine. Um, that I told you all last night, we all came from the hippie background. He's one of those old hippies that became an Adventist, kind of like some of us nut jobs. And um, not that Adventism is a nut job, but we were. <laughs> um, he's, he was, he's a solar specialist. He actually was a nuclear solar um, technician on the solar subs. And the nuclear subs. And so this is a good friend of mine. And, <laughs> and when I got all this built and all the solar panels put in place and all ready to be hooked up and in, this guy is one of those brainiacs. He came up and he told me what I needed for all the brain and all the computerized system that goes into that little building. And when I got it all there and all the batteries and everything, he came up and he helped me put it all together. And um, yeah, absolutely. And um, so the guys that actually do this for a living, I mean, they can knock this thing out in a hurry. And if you have any knowledge of building at all, you can do all this yourself. Yeah, so uh, I'll be able to install that together. Yeah, you know, it's the brain. That's the, it's the brain. that guy over in the house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's the brain. Okay, now this brother back here. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, like, I'm, in, I'm a New Jersey native, and in New Jersey, it's illegal to generate your own power. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to, if you're going to go solar, you're tied back to New Jersey Central Power and Light. They run Period. The Period. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's another thing. I'm way over time. You all have to forgive me. But I can see you're a very lively bunch. Um, when you're thinking about homesteading, you think about where you're going. You look at the laws of the land. 
and the state that you're in, and you just figure out how much freedom you have. If you want to be a slave, you stay in that state. And I'm not saying this to be ugly towards any race. We all have become slaves. We are all in slavery, brethren. And we have not got that to our heads as yet. You talk about freedom. When you get freedom and you find out that Uncle Bill is no longer knocking at your door, you all of a sudden go like, wow, this is really nice. When the grid melts down, we have blackouts in our areas I was telling you about. We don't even know what ever happens. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about nice. Well, I'll tell you, the New England states are a real piece of work. I would stay away from the New England states, and I will. I, I refuse. In fact, I wouldn't even go to Virginia because Virginia has too many restrictions of laws. There's beautiful country in Virginia, but they are they are too close to Washington D.C. for my blood. And they've got too many restrictions and your building codes. Another thing you need to look at when you move somewhere, look at what the requirements are for your building codes. Where we live, there is no restriction. I can build five houses on my place if I wanted to. Where we live, we live in Alabama. Okay. We don't even pay property taxes. Yeah, that's... That's because we've got five acres on one side of our age. Yep, that's right. That's right. Clay County. Clay County. Alabama. It seems we have to know some states are unpopulated, but they may have some nuclear weapons yes. nearby. So we have to be aware of that. Well, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I really don't want to go down that trail. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, I don't even pay attention to that. If, if nuclear happens and I'm vaporized, hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I won't know anything until Jesus comes, and that to be just that quick. I'm just not going to live in that schizophrenia feeling. I know, I know folks that are that way, and they drive themselves to near madness. I don't want to have that. I want to have, I'm going to live like I can live. <clears throat> And be at peace with the way I'm living. And what's coming down the road, I, I don't know what. We have nuclear plants, and, the, and the, the, the government wants to shut these nuclear plants down. To be honest with you, the nuclear produces electricity the cleanest and the best that we have. And these nimble... <laughs> I gotta get off my box because I'm gonna get ill real quick. These guys want to put us into slavery to control us on every way, shape, and form, and we've got to rebel against it. And the only way we can rebel against it, see, I told you I better behave myself, is start doing something about it. Find your freedom and grab a hold of it. Okay. Question is regarding uh, your home. Um, a log cabin compared to a uh, frame house. Well, as far as I'm concerned, log cabins are more expensive than my house. We looked into it. I actually looked into it. And another thing I don't like about log houses is that lumber tends to, over a period of time, creak and crack, and, and, and you end up with these different problems. You've got to keep after the chinking material with some of these companies. Um, and they're just a little more difficult, well, they're quite difficult, actually, to work with, to electrify and all these things. Um, because I was a builder, I guess I am a builder, but because I build, I always like to build my own home. I, and I didn't want to have to be relying upon somebody else's manufacturing, but a lot of people like them. I just, I just, this house here, 
You don't even want to know what I've got in this house. Yeah. Because when I built this house, versus, <laughs> versus the, oh no, forget it, the 1,800 square foot house, I had about 100,000, maybe a little bit over 100,000 into that house. That sounds like a lot of money, but that's not when it comes down to a really well structure. This house here that I have, that one versus the first one, go back, the, the, there, that house, no, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's the first picture on the, on the slide. That house that we're living in now, you know what happened during Y2K, right? Not Y2K, COVID. You know what happened to lumber prices and buildings? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I've got a, at least a quarter to almost 50% more in this 1,000-square-foot house than I had in that 1,800-square-foot house. Yes. This here is the 1,000-square-foot house. But I said, you know what? And this is right across the cuff. My wife and I both recognize my money is going to go back into my land. I don't want it in a bank. Yes. I don't like what's coming down the pike. I don't want them to sit there and put me on a credit card or a digital system and be forced to not be able to buy and sell unless I cooperate with that system. So I started sticking our money back into the land. I put it into the land, I put it into our home, I put it into our farm, I put it into our equipment, and right now I'm in the process of buying a pair of mules or looking for a good pair of mules and go back to working with horses like I used to. I wanna get back to being 100% back to self-sufficiency. I don't wanna tell y'all to do it unless I'm doing it myself. And you know what I mean. And we all don't have to go that route, but what money you got, <coughs> use it wisely. And put a plan in motion and move in that direction. But don't wait until you will not be able to do a thing. I've never, I've never lived in my life, in my age, see what is going on right now. I've never seen land go to the price it is. Y'all live back here in the South long enough to know what it used to be like. I was from California originally. I moved back here in the South almost 40 years ago. You know why I moved here? Because I could buy land. And it was cheap enough, good land. Because most of the people went back to, went to the cities from the country and abandoned the land. And us that had hippie culture mentality, and then you get this, this Adventist theology up here in your head, and all these things that we've been given, and boy, I tell you, you just get all crazy. <laughs> and when we looked across the country and saw land that we could afford and do what we wanted to do, that's where we went. And that's why we're here. All right? And so, take your money. And use it wisely. Take some time looking. Investigate your country. Investigate your counties. Because not all counties are under the same law system. And then make sure where you go, you don't have to sell it and do it again. Because I honestly believe what you're going to do this next time around will be your last go around. All right. I know we've covered a lot in this first run. But we got a few runs to go yet. Today we will be if we own our own home, we'll be offered free solar panels. Yeah. And I don't know if they're run by AI or what, but Well, I'm gonna tell you something, and you know this as well as I'm, you're old enough to know there's nothing free. <laughs> we gotta get this welfare mentality in our head. There is nothing free from the government. If the government is behind it, they want to enslave you. Do not, do not 
You'd be better off buying a piece of land and building a little, a little cabin with no electricity if you have to bucket your water from a, a spring somewhere. As to go into letting the government put a noose around your neck. They've done this to the farmers, friends. The government has control of our food industry because the farmers thought there was a free ride. And they become subsidized by the government. It's called communism. You all came from countries that have this mentality. Yes, yes, yes. And it's it's a lie, brother. And we've got to we've got to do something for ourselves because Big Brother is not going to do it for us. Is it true when, uh, when you are subsidized, sometimes they told you not to go somewhere? Oh, 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 let me tell you. Like I said, i got to get off my box. Because you get me on this box and we're going to be here until midnight. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you something. There is no free ride. Yeah. There is no such thing. <laughs> Y'all got me down here. Now you got me started, and you're trying to hush yes. me up. Yes. <laughs> now, when we look at land, we want to make sure. And you saw in some of the pictures the wood lot or the 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 wood. There was a lot of wood right there, firewood. Yes. That's a whole other story. But when you're talking about land, I want at least three quarters of that land to be in a woodlot. I want it to have enough timber on that place. That's another thing to keep in mind. Look at what your resources are on your land. And one of your biggest resources on your land is your timber lot. Do not buy, then water, then you don't want to buy land that has been timbered. They just took your assets from you. You know what I mean? If you need to build something, you can cut this thing down and take it down to the sawmill, and they will cut you out all the timber you want. If you've got a barn to build or a shed to build or whatever, you have or you can get your own sawmills. They're not that expensive, but you can do a lot of it. But if you don't have it, you're in trouble. The biggest thing you're thinking about is your firewood. It's, it's a big, big must. No homestead in this country ever was a homestead without a, a timber lot. It had to have a wood lot on it for many reasons, but that is one of the primary ones. They had to have it for their survival, so at least Three quarters of it, and then you can just divide that. If you're buying five acres, if you're buying 25 acres or whatever, 25 acres is the ultimate you need for a homestead. All right, you don't need any more than that. You can do it. You can do it down to five acres. You can do it on absolutely on less than that if you really are really, really frugal and tight. Because you need, you, when we get into it, you need at least an acre to an acre and a half of tillable, workable ground. What about pine trees? The pine trees. Yeah. Good to deal with. Well, pine trees are great. Not to burn. Yeah, not to burn. Well, I mean, if that's what you got, that's what you're going to use. Right, outside. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. But, you know, pine trees are a great asset on a piece of land. It has all kinds of benefits. In fact, pine trees are great medicine, and most people don't even know that. Very good. They're wonderful. They're, they just have some wonderful properties in them, and they're great for building. They're great for all kinds of different things. It's not the greatest firewood, but it is still firewood. I recommend looking for land that has more hardwood on it. You know, your various different hardwoods. 
Um, you know, our place has hardwood and cedar, and I like that combination because I like the cedar, and I can use cedar for a lot of things. And so all my kindling comes out of cedar because it starts a fire nice with very little smoke. And pine's the same way. You know, you can, you, so when you look at your land and what you're looking for is make sure you have at least, at least half of that land in the timber lot. At least. The rest of it's gotta be for, for animals, for food production, and a house site. And by the way, these houses, you you didn't see something on these these houses. You know what you didn't see is what Grandma and Grandpa used to have. Ah, oh, an outhouse. That house is completely self-sufficient and has a complete septic system in it, just as modern as anybody's. And that's another thing you've got to look for when you go to doing a homestead. What is your county like? What is it going to cost you to put a septic system in? What state can you go in? You go to certain states and you're looking at ten to twenty-five thousand dollars for a septic system. Where I live, twenty-five hundred to three thousand dollars with a beautiful septic system that'll work for us until Jesus comes. So you got to you got to look at those things. <clears throat> you also got to be wary of of, of uh, easements and uh, yeah. drilling drilling rights. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, in. mineral rights and all that. Yeah, a lot of stuff, folks. A lot of stuff, and we've run out of time for this this segment. And um, we'll come back around three o'clock, I think it is, and we're gonna work. We're gonna look at this water. Uh, the necessity of water, those three systems we talked about are what? Shelter, water, food. Those are the three major necessities. As you can see, when you get into this subject, it just goes like this. <laughs>